Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Noah, but then it says that Noah was moved with fear. And I would like to speak to you on the subject, the fear factor of faith. The fear factor of faith. Thank you. Please be seated and let's open our heart to the Bible. The Lord put this verse of scripture in my mind a week or so ago. And as many times as I've read Hebrews 11, taught and preached from Hebrews 11, this had never jumped out at me. And isn't it amazing how the Bible has that ability to speak to you expressly, the King James says, or specifically at a particular period of time for a reason. Normally, we pit fear against faith. We see them as opposites and never complementary. God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? Of bondage again to fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. But fear has a role in our relationship with God. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Fear of punishment can awaken you to the faith in the promises of God. Amen. Fear is a factor in your faith walk with God. And by faith, this verse says that it was by faith that Noah acted as he did. Hebrews 11 recounts how people in the Old Testament live by faith in God. They obtained a good report through faith, even though they, they did not receive the promise of the Holy Spirit that we have received. Hebrews 11.6 explains to us the two components of faith. Faith is multifaceted, but the Bible speaks for itself. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that He is. And that he is a rewarder, the second component. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So faith begins by belief in God. Faith begins by believing that God exists. But it is not mere mental assent that there is a God. But it calls for an action on our part. The Bible said that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. The Bible said that God did not leave himself without a witness. He gave us rain and fruitful seasons. He filled our heart with joy or gladness. So God speaks to everyone on planet earth through creation and also through our conscience. Those are known as general revelation. The God that you can know through nature. The God that reveals himself on the inside of our conscience. But that will never save you. It will cause you to turn toward the Lord to discover Him through specific revelation that comes from His Bible. So believing that God exists is the starting point of faith and salvation. But faith has to go beyond just believing that there is a God. The writer James said that you believe that there is one God. He said you do well. The devils also believe and they tremble. Devils know that there's only one God. They know his name, right? In fact, they said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They know the name of Jesus and they tremble at the existence of Almighty God. But angels are not saved by having that first component of faith that they believe that God exists. Faith has a second component according to Hebrews 11.6. Without faith it is impossible to please Him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So just mental assent never saved anyone. Even accepting Christ as your Savior, the mental decision to do that does not save you. But the second component of faith is believing that if you will go after God, if you will diligently go after Him, that He will reward you. This is the nature of the stories in the Bible, and especially Hebrews 11, of people who believed in God, who then pursued God and were rewarded by Him for their faith. The first example in Hebrews 11 is Abel who offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, his brother. The second example is Enoch who walked with God and he was not for God took him. He walked so closely with the Lord that the Lord gave him a personal rapture and he was taken off the earth into the presence of God. Noah is the third example in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 of faith. He's described in the Bible as the 10th descendant of Adam in the line of Seth. His father's name was Lamech and Lamech had Noah when he was 182 years old. Genesis 5.29 says, And he called his name Noah, saying this same shall comfort us. The name Noah may mean comfort. The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. The Bible also tells us in Genesis 5.32 that when Noah was 500 years old that he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now people lived a long time Back then, I mistakenly said that Methuselah lived 950 years this morning. As I said it, I meant to say more than he lived 969 years. Before the flood, people lived a long time. Abraham's 500 years old and he's just having kids, right? You know, or, and evidently when Noah was 480 years old, the Lord spoke to him about his world. The Lord said to Noah, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty. The Lord was not saying that a span of life in the future would be a hundred twenty years, but that he was giving the people of the earth a hundred twenty years to turn back to him before he destroyed the earth. A hundred and twenty years to repent. Now, why would they need to repent? What was the moral climate of Noah's day? The Bible tells us in Genesis 6, 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, the Bible is the inspired word of God, the very breathed word of God, every punctuation mark in the original language is inspired by God. And this phrase, this verse rather, is a mouthful. God looked down on the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of people was only evil continually. That is a wicked world. There were no good thoughts. There were no pure thoughts among the people in Noah's generation. Verses 11 through 13 of Genesis 6. And the earth was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. We have seen the increase of violence in our generation. But in Noah's day, the earth was filled with violence. Maybe we should buckle our seatbelts as we wait on the coming of the Lord. Amen? And God looked upon the earth and behold... It was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth 
is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. But despite the wickedness of Noah's day, life rocked along. From the time God saw the wickedness, the 120 years leading up to the flood, the Lord saw this. And, and it seemed while there was all this wickedness, there, were, there was no visible clock counting down to the flood. Jesus, speaking about the end of time, referred back to the end of Noah's time. And he said, as it was in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. That's not sinful. Now, they were sinful, but eating and drinking just depicts life as usual. They were marrying and given in marriage. Young people were getting married. Parents were giving their children away, mostly probably in arranged marriages or whatever. But... Jesus said that they just continued with life as usual until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew it not until the flood came and took them all away. And Jesus said, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. God is not going to give a five minute warning. That's why we should live a repented, overcoming life. That's why we should not allow sin to build up in our life. If you sin, confess your sins. Amen? And God will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In a vivid reminder of God's past judgments, the Apostle Peter called Noah a preacher of righteousness, one of only Eight people who were saved, the Apostle Peter says. Now, we don't have a sample of Noah's sermons. We don't know what he said. But you'd have to believe that he preached what Jesus preached, what the Apostles preached. He preached the message that Jonah preached to Nineveh, that you need to turn from your sins, you need to repent, amen. That God is coming to destroy the world and you need to turn from your sins to God. Noah, this verse says, Hebrews eleven seven, that Noah was moved by fear. What made Noah afraid? God told Noah that something was coming on the earth. Verse 7 of Hebrews 11 we're going to read it several times this afternoon. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. So God told Noah, a flood is coming. Destruction is coming. There is judgment that is coming on the earth. But it was not seen as yet. The Bible is clear that one component of faith is the ability to see what you cannot literally see. You see by faith things that do not appear. And Noah, by faith, believed that when God said, I'm going to destroy the entire earth with the flood, Noah believed the Lord, and the thinking that God would destroy the earth moved Noah with fear. God showed him things that were going to come. Now the earth had never experienced a flood like this. And there are some who speculate that it had never rained on the earth. We know that before the fall of sin in the garden, that there was no rain at that time. We don't really know that for certain in Noah's day. But nonetheless, they had never experienced what was going to happen to them when God got ready to pour out His judgment on the earth. So Noah has an evidence, it's called faith, of something that is not yet seen that he believes is going to happen. And Genesis, the Lord gave Noah a basic plan of salvation. He told Noah that I want you to build an ark. And he told Noah that he was going to destroy the earth. Genesis six seventeen, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven 
And everything that is in the earth shall die. And when Noah heard it, the Bible said he was moved with fear by what God showed him would happen. Noah's fear was a reverent fear. It was a godly fear. It was a well-placed fear. It wasn't a phobia. It wasn't a panic. It was the kind of fear that brings change in your life. Fear can paralyze you or it can move you to action. Amen? And you have a choice just to say one day God is going to destroy this world with fire. One day God is going to sentence ungodly people to an eternal lake of fire. And you may fear hell and you should. You may fear that lake of fire that will never end the torment for lost people and you should. But there are many people in our world that while they know in the back of their mind or they were raised in some church in a Sunday school class, they know what the Bible said. They are not moved by their fear. My message today is to show you the role that fear plays in faith. Amen. That there is a fear factor for what we want to escape of the punishments of God. That we now embrace the promises of God that he is giving us. Noah believed that God would keep his word. Noah believed that God was going to do what he said he would do. That he would destroy the earth with a flood. So the Bible said that because Noah, had he had faith in God, God told him things that were going to happen that had never happened. He was moved by fear, and then Noah did something about it. And you know people who will tell you, I know I need to get things right. I know I need to repent. I know I need to serve God. But they never prepare their hearts for heaven. But Noah, the Bible said in verse 7, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Several years ago, on July 27, 2014, I preached a message entitled, Build an Ark. It is not this message. But in that message, I told you about the ark that Noah prepared. You might have forgotten something I preached in 2014. So let me just quickly remind you. The ark by our best English standards, measurements, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It had a total volume of 1,500,000 cubic feet. The gross tonnage exceeded 14,000 tons. It had a square footage of space of about 97,700 square feet which is the equivalent of about 20 basketball courts. On the ark could have been as many as 35,000 vertebrates. The average size would have been about the size of a sheep if you take a little animal and an elephant, right? A modern boxcar train can carry about, a, with 150 boxcars, could have carried all the animals that were on Noah's ark. But Noah's ark, had a carrying capacity equivalent to 520 boxcars, more than three times what was necessary to carry that load. God knew how to prepare an ark big enough to save every animal that would go in the ark and only eight souls. There is one window. It might have gone all the way around. I hope so. I've thought about what it might have smelled like without a long window in the ark. And there was only one door. There was just one. The ark that Noah built was not a luxury liner. It was probably more like a, a barge. It was a lifeboat. It was God's means of salvation. And it was fear that moved Noah to prepare this ark. Faith moved Noah to an obedient action to build the ark according to the plans that God gave him. He went to work on this ark and he preached and he built and he did it like God said. He told him how to build it 
And then he said, I want you to waterproof it with pitch on the outside and on the inside. I'm glad we understand that when God protects us, he puts his spirit on the inside, but you can also see it on the outside. We believe that holiness is a flesh and spirit. So Noah's got this ark waterproof on the inside and the outside. Noah is an amazing man. Noah, uh, according to Genesis 6 and 8, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You think about God, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth. He's looking for show, to find someone that he can show himself strong on their behalf. And in this wicked, wicked world, perhaps there was only one man. I don't know about his sons, his wife. They were on the ark with him. But, but the Bible said that Noah, out of an entire ungodly world, when everyone was corrupt and evil and violence filled the earth, here's Noah that says, not me. I'm not living like that. Well, Noah, you're a weirdo. Everybody's doing violence. Everybody's immoral. Noah, not me. And because of Noah's righteous life, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible said, Genesis 6 and 9, that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God like Enoch walked with God. You know, God didn't say, you know, I just need to find anybody. I want to save somebody so I'll lower my standard to fit the standards of the world. God didn't say anybody will do. It's pretty clear that God would have destroyed the entire world if Noah had not found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God will never lower his standard to get more people on the ark or into heaven. He will find people who love him, who serve him, who want to be citizens of that world and not this world. So if you're trying to fit in here, maybe you need to think about who you're trying to please. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And in Noah's day, just like our day, there was only one plan of salvation. There was only one ark. Amen? There was not a fleet of arks. There was one way to be saved from the flood. And that one ark had one door. And you could only go in by that door. That was the only way God said that anyone could be saved. Jesus said something similar when he said, I and the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen? I'm glad I understand that there's one way to be saved. There's one door in, but we've been invited to go in that door of salvation. Amen. And the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 3 compares Noah's ark to water baptism. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. This is the New Living Translation. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not the removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience it, baptism, is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the same way that getting on the ark saved Noah and his family, getting in the water in the name of Jesus Christ separates you from the judgment that is coming on this world. Amen. And I'm glad I understand that you understand that baptism is of water and of spirit. Amen. Hebrews eleven seven. Noah's actions condemn the world. In this entire verse, I want you to go to that middle phrase. By Noah's action, by preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by that he condemned the world. Now, it doesn't imply that Noah walked around his city condemning people and judging them. He did preach to them, and I believe he preached a message of repentance, but his actions... Noah was a light in a very dark world. And his godly light must have been a source of conviction 
and condemnation to everyone who saw how he lived in the face of the peer pressure and the culture that had totally gone away from God. And Noah's righteousness, Noah's faith in God that was moved by fear, building the ark, it condemned the world. The Bible said in Noah's 600th year that the Lord allowed the floodwaters to be upon the earth. Now there's no evidence that Noah tried to condemn the world, but he would not conform to his culture and his godly life caused the condemnation on the world. 120 years, God says. They've got 120 years. You're going to build a monstrosity of a boat like that. You're going to have to work a long time long time to get it right. And I want to repeat the words of Jesus right here from Matthew 24, 38. For as it was in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that the flood came. That, excuse me, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. One day, with no warning, time had expired on God's time clock of mercy. Genesis 7, 1 says that the Lord said to Noah, Come, you and your house into the ark, for I have seen, for, for, for you I have seen righteous before me in this generation. I really never thought about these words. I I'd, I'd read a couple things about the Lord saying come. But I visualized this morning perhaps the presence of God. Who fills all of time and space right. He's everywhere at the same time. But from inside the ark he bids Noah come. Noah come bring your family into this place of salvation. Amen. Sounds like the presence of God. And so Noah and Mrs. Noah go on the ark. His three sons and their wives, they come into the ark. Animals two by two and seven of every clean kind. Genesis 7 speaks of this. They come into the ark. And some of those clean animals were saved for sacrifice. In seven days, the Lord says, it's going to happen. Genesis 7, 4. I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights and every living substance that I have made will I destroy off the face of the earth. No wonder Noah is moved by fear of God's punishment to faith in God's promises. Noah, the Bible said, did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And now for seven days, they can only wait. I know that in this day, Jesus said, or excuse me, the apostle Peter said, that in the last time, there will be scoffers. And they will say in the last day, where is the promise of his coming? Since the days of our fathers, for many generations, we've heard about the rapture coming. We've heard that it could happen at any time. And they would scoff and they would say, where is the promise of his coming? Since our fathers died, everything continues as it is today. And Jesus said that they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And I envisioned the scoffers perhaps of Noah's day making fun of Noah and his family. There you are building this. What kind of a man are you dedicating all your time to that boat? Why would you go to church like that? Why would you raise your family like this? Nobody raises their family like that anymore. And why would you get in that boat? Noah, I don't know what it was like. Well, the Bible said in Genesis 7, 16, that from the outside, the Lord shut them in. That must have been a moment that struck shockwaves of panic toward anybody who is gawking at the boat when the door suddenly, by an invisible hand perhaps, just shut the door and Noah is in the ark. 
And the Bible said in Genesis 7, 600 years of Noah's life, that same day, it was in the second month, on the 17th day of the month. Isn't God amazing in how specific He is? He tells us exactly in Noah's life when this flood occurred. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. I, I wondered, and I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I wondered as the rain fell and the floodwaters rose and the water grew deeper and deeper, if some of the people on the outside tried to find a way to get on the inside, clawing at the gopher wood, wishing, praying that they could get in, but it was too late for them. Forty days, forty nights. The floodwaters, Genesis 7 says, grew deeper and covered the ground and lifted that boat high above the earth. And the waters rose higher and higher above the ground and the boat floated safely on the surface above the judgments of God below. Finally, Genesis 7, 19, the waters covered even the highest mountains on the earth, more than rising more than 22 feet above the highest peaks. And all living things on the earth died. Birds and domestic animals, wild animals, small animals that scurry along the ground and all the people, everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. And God wiped out every living thing on the earth. People, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground and the birds of the sky and all were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him in the boat. And the floodwaters covered the earth for 150 days. On the outside, there was death. On the inside, there was life. And tragically, outside of eight human beings, every person on planet Earth perished in the flood. That's why today my message is the fear factor of faith. Noah lived to see the judgments of God executed on the earth. But before it ever happened, he was moved by the fear of what would happen. And his fear moved him to action. And it was by faith that Noah, being warned of God, of things which were not yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. And then the Bible said that by his action, he became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah's action put him in the stead in the company of everyone mentioned in Hebrews 11 and everyone not named there, every person that has ever lived by faith, he became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The fear of coming judgment, awakened Noah. And then he acted in faith in God. Noah had faith in God whom he had never seen. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord because of his godly life. And he believed that God would do what he said he would do, both good and bad. And he built an ark to save his family. Let me pause right here to refer back to the message I preached several years ago. Every father, every mother, every single adult, every one of us need to go to work today. And we need to build an ark to save our family. We need to build a means of salvation. We need to get inside the church where there is a place of safety. Noah did. But, but what about you? Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you really? Do you? Do I? Do we really believe? 
that God will never destroy the earth by water again? But do we really believe? The rainbow promises that. But do we really believe what the Bible says? That God will destroy this world with fire. Do we really believe in a literal burning lake of fire? Just like we want to believe and do believe in a literal heaven in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven adorned like a bride for her husband. If we really believe that, then like Noah, we should be moved by our fear. Noah moved by fear and then he acted in faith. And you know, I, as I've studied this message and pondered this this week, I thought about this. You know, if you don't believe in the punishments of God, you will probably not believe in the promises of God. Because they're connected. And if you say you believe that Jesus is a Savior, then you have to also believe His Word that he is also the judge of the whole earth. Amen. Hebrews, the New Testament tells us that our God is a consuming fire. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't live our lives in fear. We live our lives in faith. But fear of coming judgment keeps us on our toes, keeps us remembering that there is a judgment coming, that there is a new heaven and a new earth coming. The Apostle Peter wrote about people who should have known and did know, but were willingly ignorant. He said it like this. Beloved, I now write to you in the second epistle. He said, I'm trying to stir up your pure minds. That you may be mindful of the words that were spoken to us by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord, knowing this first. That scoffers, I mentioned this verse earlier, will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. And they're going to be saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But He said, for this, they willingly forget. Oh, wait, wait a second. What about the flood? All things have not begun the same since the beginning of creation. Aren't you forgetting something? The archaeological proof, the historical proof, the biblical evidence of a flood that destroyed the entire world. Are you not remembering that if God did it then, He would do it again? They willfully forget that the world by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, the apostle Peter's writing this, are reserved for fire unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Don't mistakenly think that the Lord is slack. He said the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness. But instead of God just not paying attention, He is long-suffering toward us. He gave Noah's generation 120 years. And the reason we're here right now is until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm preaching this message that fear would move you to faith. That fear of what could happen to you would move you to faith in salvation. First Peter, 2 Peter 3.10 but the day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord in the Bible is an expression of the judgment of God. And you see the day of the Lord with few exceptions. It always refers to the judgment of God that will be poured out on this earth. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 
And Jesus told us that no one would know, and just like Noah's day, until the flood came and took them all away. No man knows the day or the hour. He that shall come will come. He will not tarry. We are to look for new heavens and a new earth. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein will be burned up. Therefore, Peter writes to the church, since all these things, everything you can see, will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. I don't know what those words do to you, but I believe like Noah, we should be moved with fear because of coming judgment. But then Peter writes to them in verse 13, Nevertheless, we, we're not them, we're the church. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, Peter says, because of that, beloved, looking forward to these things, there's an action that you need to take. You need to be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless. Then he goes back to repeat it again and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. The reason God is waiting for you is so you could be saved and not be lost.